Welcome to the REI Hacker Podcast, where we unlock the secrets of real estate success. Join us as we dive into the journeys of top investors, mentors, and industry experts. Learn from their experiences and navigate the highs and lows of the investing world. And now, let's hand it off to our host, Benson Juarez. Welcome, welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for being here on this edition of the REI Hacker Podcast. I'm really excited because my friend Derek Dombach is with us from Wisconsin. Uh, Derek has been a successful real estate investor since 2003. He's a national speaker and international best-selling author. Uh, Derek has co-founded a private lending company and hosts a national mastermind group called the REI Circle of Trust. Derek, thank you so much for being here, man. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule. I know you got tons of exciting things going on, and I can't wait to hear and get some updates. What's been going on with you? Well, man, I appreciate you having me, Benson, first of all. And, you know, it's just like anybody else out there, right? We're all in the grind. We're all trying to to uh, stay busy, make money, and and uh, but taking time to do things like this and podcast and and jump on and share knowledge. I, I love it. I'll I'd do it for you anytime and and anybody else. Thanks, man. Well, I thought you were gonna try to make me feel special there for a moment, but then you threw in anybody else, which is totally cool. I'm okay with it. Um, but and you've been in the business since 2003, so you've seen the ups and downs of the market. You've seen all different. Uh, you know, scenarios and and you've adapted your business to be able to be creative and um, all these different scenarios. So like you do creative deal structure, wholesaling, flipping, landlording. Um, you're also lending money. Like how did all of that develop? I mean, the, the very long version would take us multiple episodes. So I'll give you the cliff notes. I, I had to get creative because I lost everything when the markets crashed in 2007. And, you know, at that time, I, I learned some hard lessons about not having control of your business. So using banks, for example, they really are the ones that are, are in control. Or even when I did co-fund the, or co-found the lending company, we did that because the lender does have the bulk of the control. And, when the banks stopped lending and the markets crashed, I, I had to pivot. I took on partners when I needed to, I did joint ventures, but specifically I started learning how to properly talk to people and negotiate. And that's oftentimes I think lost on newbies or even very experienced investors, uh, especially today with all the tech. Right, I can just go make a random offer and I don't even have to talk to somebody. I, I can just do everything through a computer. And I've found that if you actually learn how to negotiate properly and, and interact with people face-to-face -face, on the phone, but but talking, right? The lost art of actually talking, and you can you can get a lot accomplished. And so I I didn't just have this epiphany and, and I knew it all overnight. I mean, it took me years and years and years. And what I did, Benson, was I would record um, my phone conversations or if I was in person, if I couldn't record it, which now is easy to do. We all have phone record or voice recorders on our phones, right? You can turn a voice recorder on and put it in your pocket and sit there with a seller or a banker or a lawyer or whoever. And, you know, as long as you're using it for your internal purposes, it wouldn't matter. But I would study that. I would take notes and I would figure out what, you know, how do they react to my body language, to my tone, to what I said, how I said it. And I started to see patterns. And so now that's what I do in my creative deal structuring. I, I get people to open up very quickly about what their challenges are. And then I solve their challenges. And that's all I really believe a good real estate investor should do is solve people's challenges. And when you solve enough people's challenges, you profit. Absolutely. What was one of the biggest takeaways that you got from listening to yourself talk in those early days? Was there something there that you're like, oh my God, I can't believe I say that. Or yeah. man, my, my tone is way off. Or I can't believe how these people are reacting. What was the big takeaway? 
big takeaway is if you don't believe in your product, and in this case, your product is you, that comes across in all of your body language and your tone. Mm. And you've heard, everybody has heard, I should say, the, the phrase, fake it till you make it. But that that only works to the degree that you still believe in what you can do to help people. If you're trying to be manipulative, um, you know, you should get called out and, and but they're going to feel that maybe you'll get away with it once in a while. But to truly become a negotiations master, you you have to have the right integrity and the right motives because you absolutely if if you do it um, with manipulative intentions, you can take advantage of people very easily. But that was the number one aha was I had to get out of my own way. I had to believe in in my product that I I was genuine. Remember, I I had gone through the downturn, and part of that was I lost eight properties to foreclosure. I ended up in bankruptcy. You know, I could sit in front of a, a, a specifically a home seller that was in financial distress, and they could see and feel how genuine I was. I can sit there and say, Benson, I know how you feel. I've just lost eight properties you know, in the last few years. And that, you know, really gets people open up. The other thing that I do specifically is, is a lot of storytelling, but storytelling in a way that moves the narrative forward. Always. You don't tell a story just to tell a story. And that deescalates and, and keeps people very calm. And, and it, it just, it, it creates a very, very quick bond. Oh Yeah. Yeah, and that's the cool thing about negotiation too, is that there's lots of different potential outcomes. And you could have the exact same outcome where you negotiate a certain price and terms and the homeowner can come out of that negotiation feeling two completely different ways, depending upon how you present that. They come out of it with buyer's remorse or seller's remorse, or they can come out of it feeling like they got taken care of and somebody has their best interest in mind. Like, how do you, how do you sway them one way or the other so that they come out of that thing thinking, man, Derek's taking care of me as opposed to Derek just took advantage of me? Well, personally, I feel like if, if you're the other person in that negotiation ever feels like you took advantage of them, then shame on you because you were somewhat manipulative in some way, shape, or form. Even if you weren't trying to be, they shouldn't feel that way. It doesn't mean that they're always going to be jumping up and down for joy. I mean, if somebody's in a truly financial distress situation, um, the relief might be all they get, but they shouldn't feel the seller's or buyer's remorse. For me, when I enter, enter into specifically talking about buying property, any conversation, I want to let them know I have multiple ways to help them in the first two minutes of the conversation. And so I have a little elevator pitch that I throw out there and I think everybody should have their own that feels natural to them, but here's mine. Benson, you're the home seller. Uh, Benson, just so you know, we buy houses in many different ways. All cash is not a problem, but that's typically gonna be my lowest offer. If that doesn't work for you, we could look at taking over your debt if you have debt, or we can make payments to you over time if you don't. Or in some cases, we just lease your property and we we buy at a later date. That works really well with like landlords that are trying to offset capital gains. I just let you know all these things that we have multiple strategies to help you, but I am gonna have to ask you some questions that most people probably wouldn't ask. Is that okay? Yeah. End pitch, right? End pitch. Right. So what have we just done? Every question we ask moving forward, whether it's uncomfortable or comfortable, they've just given us permission to ask. And that doesn't mean there might not be a little bit of backlash later in that conversation, but you can always go back and say, hey, Benson, remember, I'm just asking you this so I can try and help you. Okay, I'm not trying to pry into your personal life. And it de-escalates. So setting up the, in my case, these are mostly phone calls because I have a very large area that I buy real estate in. So I, I don't go and meet with people in person until we've had these phone conversations, but you do the same thing in person. And so yeah, now moving forward, I'm gonna get as much 
detail as I possibly can and just let them talk as much as they want. I, I try not to cut people off. You know, if I ask a question, I let them talk until I feel like they're done with that answer. And then I'll ask another one. And I think that's a, another lost art. I mean, you do want to control the time frame, but you don't want to be the one doing the majority of the talking. Right. So once I know what their challenges are, um, it's now time to get creative and I'll kind of give you a definition of what I define or how I define creative deal structuring. Buying a property subject to or with seller financing or with leases, options, all of those things are just ways to finance. It's not, there's nothing creative about purchasing subject to somebody's mortgage. It's just another way of financing. What I consider creative deal structuring is when you stack these strategies together. So I may buy somebody's property subject to, and they carry back a mortgage for the remainder of, of the sale price. Perhaps there's some cash involved as a down payment. Then I could fix that property up, put a tenant in it, lease option that property to the tenant. And over a period of several years, I've struck, you know, structured that with two, three, four, five different parts or or strategies. Okay. So I'll give you a quick story and this will prove the point. This woman's name was Jan. Jan called me. She had to move out of her property fairly quickly. She had a a uh, it was a medical situation with a family member out of state. She was two months behind on her payments. She wanted pretty close to retail for the property, but at the time her terms were good on her first mortgage. And so she, she needed $10,000 up front. I really just needed to do a $5,000 cleanup on the property to make it rent ready. And she was willing to carry back the remainder balance of the sale price at 0% interest, which at $200 a month came out like six years of payments. So we bought the property for 105 total, gave her $10,000 down, making payments to her for $200 a month for the next six years at 0%. Took over her first mortgage subject to after I caught up a couple of the payments that she was behind. So now we're fixing her credit over time. And so I needed about $20,000 total to do this whole structure. Now I have little bit of a religion against using my own money. So I called a financial friend. His name was Dan. And I said, Dan, uh, I know you have $20,000 sitting around in your Roth IRA because I'm very nosy with my financial friends and I know what they have. I said, how would you feel about a, a participating note where I give you 6% interest only and I will give you 25% of the, I'm sorry, 20% of the equity in the future when I sell this property? in your Roth IRA. And he said, yep, sounds good to me. So his yield depends on when the property sells, but he knows he's getting 6% for sure, right? And he's getting that on a quarterly basis. So I have no cash into the deal. We get tenants in there. They give us about $5,000 down on a lease with an option. Two years later, the tenants exercise their option, buy the house. Dan gets paid off. Jan gets paid off. Jan's bank gets paid off. We put profit in our pocket. That is deal structuring. That is multiple layers of strategies that you put into that one deal, all the way from buying it to how you sold it at the back end. Yeah. Um, that's where I think that, you know, a lot of newbies can get caught up, right? Like that initial question I had for you with, you're talking about the, the, the same outcome with two different scenarios with people feeling two different ways it might not be that somebody was being manipulative or trying to take advantage of somebody, but it might just be complete inexperience and just fumbling through the process and making some mistakes in the paperwork or the way that it's presented. And then again, that person coming out of that scenario, not feeling good about it. So, What's the best way for a beginner to to enter this? Is it just to start off with something basic and and get, you know, cut their teeth on that and then develop those skills and do more complex strategies? 
it's it's like anything benson um you can read all the books watch all the youtube you want uh i i believe for me at least when i'm in a deal that's when it really sinks in because the theories are theories and i don't think i've ever done two deals that have been exactly the same so subject to purchasing it it's it's a buzzword now you know it's there's great rates that are out there locked interest rates that we can come and take over but again it's been around forever now it's it's exciting because it's a great time to, to do it but done wrong you can harm people and you can harm yourself so the best way that i believe is is go and get involved with somebody that's got experience and partner with them jv with them so i tell people in my local market and actually all over the country if you've got a deal and you don't know how to structure it, no problem. I, I'm not greedy. You know, give me a, a, a slice of the pie. I'll help you structure. And you take the lion's share. So I've got wholesalers, for example. They, I tell them at our, our local RIA meetings, if it doesn't fit your cash model or your wholesaling model, but the sellers are willing to have further discussions, don't throw that lead away. Like, let's set up a conference call. If we can structure something creative, I'll keep the property there. You're a wholesaler. You don't want to hold property. Cool. I'll still give you your wholesale fee, but you can listen in and, and look over my shoulder. And that's how I did it. I, you know, I had mentors and, and friends in the business. I'd get into a deal and I'd call them up and say, you know, Bill Cook is somebody that you and I both know and, and Peter Fortunato and Dyke Spotiford and some of these, some of these guys that are, you know, very highly renowned creative deal structures. I spent years building that network and, and going to their events and getting to know them and became personal friends with them. And, and to a certain degree, sometimes too personal, like with Bill, but um, you know, at the end of the day, if, if you're getting started and you don't know how, just go to your local RIA and start talking to people there. Right. And, and it just, I don't think, at least for me, I don't think you can just go on YouTube and watch some videos and all of a sudden go and do a structure I just explained. Right. No, there's, there's too many moving parts and you know, there's, there's what you say and there's also what's written on the mm -hmm. contract. Right. And those are two different things. And there's all kinds of lingo and jargon that you may like we said sub two, like several times today, like a lot of people listening don't even know what that means. Right. So there's, there's definitely like the definitions of the jargon and the acronyms and all that stuff can be overwhelming to a newbie, but that's why you've invested time into helping others. Right. So you, you, you help local people through the RIA and you do some training and coaching. Um, it sounds like that's something that you're passionate about is, is helping the new people come up. Yeah. And that's actually, um, I, I have my own show called the generations of wealth. And it's at the generations of wealth.com and uh, had some very, very high quality guests, yourself included, um, and other people that that's what it's all about. Like we, we don't talk just about necessarily real estate either. It's a lot of discussions about vision and, you know, I've had guests on there that talk about stocks and some insurance people. And so it's, it's a little bit more diversified. Um, but that's, the whole point of the generations of wealth movement is I had people that, that helped me with this and, you know, my mentors and, and now it's the opportunity for myself and my kids, for example, um, they're very much involved in our business. We host a conference every year on a cruise ship and I encourage people to bring their families. Uh, my kids are there. They're building a network of other kids around the country who have parents that think the way we do. Those types of things. That's how you learn this this side of business. And that going all the way back to one of your original questions, you know, what was some of my aha moments? I never built a network in the first seven or eight years in this business. So when the markets did crash in 2006, seven, eight, I didn't have anybody to turn to. I I was on my own. And, you know, we went down. Now uh, you and I had a conversation before we started recording. 
there's there's challenges every day that happen to all of us, right? And and to just be able to talk things through for five minutes with somebody that's been through it, that's huge. So I would encourage newbies, people that have been in this business for 20 plus years, build your network. And that makes it easier to say, hey, you know what? I heard this guy named Derek. I know he knows how to deal structure. Maybe I can just reach out to him and, and ask him a question or two. Yeah, more than happy to do that, right? And then over time, you build those relationships. My caution is don't waste people's time. Okay, we all, we're all equal in one way across this entire earth. We all have the same 24 hours in a day. And, you know, time is precious. So that's my advice. Go out there, build your network, find people that have done it, latch on to them in a good way. And, uh, and then when, when you do learn it, then give back and help others. Oh yeah. And there's so much to be said for the strategy and the tactics and like the how to's of this business, but that's maybe 20% of, of everything that's needed to get a deal done in the first place. It's really 80% mindset, which is why I like that you guys focus on mindset and, you know, helping people to overcome, you know, the, the inner demons that are stopping them from taking action. Right. It's, it's those inner beliefs, the limiting beliefs that prevent people from writing that contract or, you know, doing, do, learning the actual process or, or, or even getting in the right rooms with people. Right. We've, some of us have imposter syndrome and think that like, man, well, I don't deserve to be in this room with these people. Why would Derek want to spend five minutes answering my questions? Like, I'm not worthy of that. Like, What's your perspective on on these limiting beliefs and, and and how people can overcome those? We all have them. I I had them for years. Um, I I am from a rural area in Wisconsin. I mean, for a long time, I thought, why would anybody want to spend time with with this guy from the middle of nowhere, Wisconsin? And you, to me, you get over that by being around the right people and being encouraged. Uh, I had so many people asking me, Hey, can I take you to lunch? And I used to do that a lot. And then you start to realize, okay, I, I can help that one person for an hour, but yeah, maybe I should be helping a hundred people for an hour. So I'll start speaking at Aria. Okay. And then you do that for a period of time and it helps you get over your imposter syndrome. And then now you're like, oh gosh, I could be a guest on podcasts and I could help a thousand people in an hour or 10,000 people or whatever the number is. And so you, you have to, number one, believe in, again, negotiations 101, believe in what you're selling. I'm selling me. Right now I'm selling me to your entire audience. And I, I want to come across as genuine because that's how I feel I am. But I had to get over my own fears to even start going on podcast as a guest. I started doing that a couple of years ago and, and it's fun. I love it. It's great. But, you know, same thing. You, you start thinking, well, gosh, what can I offer Benson's audience? And imposter syndrome, it, it creeps in all the time. It's oh, yeah. just having the power to say, nope. Uh uh, that's BS. I know I can help somebody, and if I only help one person on your show, hundred percent worth my time. And it's one of those things that never goes away. Like it, on a day by day basis, you could have imposter syndrome sneak up on you because it depends on the situation. Like you know, I've been in rooms before where like I know, I know, privy, I know the data, I know how to analyze it, and I know all that, and then the next podcast I'm on somebody asked me a question about oh like you're so successful you've done all this stuff and all of a sudden the, the imposter syndrome sneaks up behind me and it's like wait a second no I'm here to talk about data and privy why, why are you talking about all this other stuff and so like you never know when it's going to creep up on you but you just have to be prepared to overcome it consistently through life because there's always going to be larger and bigger challenges and, and bigger goals to accomplish yeah, and I think we have to be careful too when comparing ourselves to everybody else because when we get in certain rooms, I mean, there's 
on the surface, it looks fantastic, right? We got we got guys and gals that have just done these remarkable projects and these big real estate deals and business deals and other types of businesses they're in. And, and, and that can, again, that can knock you down to where I'm not even going to approach Benson because on the outside, I feel like Benson has done so much that he's unapproachable. And the reality is most of us that are, are giving back or want to give back, we want to be approached. We enjoy helping others because people helped us get to where we are. And, and the other side of that is the grass is not always greener on the other side. You know, doing a $100 million development project um, versus just doing a million dollar project, it sounds sexy, but it may or may not be. So sometimes be careful what you wish for because mm -hmm. you may just get it and it may not be what you thought it was. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And in this business, you know, a lot of where we look up to people is by the number of deals they've done or the complexity of deals or the the revenue generating deals. Like those are the things that we like. And then there, like you said, there's business building and there's all these other things. And one of the, th the things that, I get challenged with when when I'm when I'm on podcasts is when they talk about like you know the story like the backstory and the success and you know it always like seems like the overnight success kind of scenario and it's like man we've all got these struggles you know like the entrepreneurial journey is not a direct line and it's certainly not just up and to the right you know it's it's one of these scenarios and you know you start to see some success but even then you know, depending upon the question or the room you're in, it, sometimes it just doesn't fit or feel right. And those are, that's, those are the challenges that I face. Um, what is it today that you, that's one of the biggest challenges in, in, for you and your business, what are you trying to overcome? So this year is, is a big pivot year for me. Um, my former business partner bought me out of our lending company and, you know, we were partners for 10 years. We we amicably decided to part ways because we had a difference of vision of where we wanted the future to come to or go to, I should say. So yeah, I'm I'm back in acquisition mode, which I love. I'm a deal junkie. And so growing my real estate holdings and and also I've I've put on probably for the last three, four years, I put the brakes on looking at larger deals. And so I'm, I want to get into more RV parks, um, you know, strip mall type of things, larger commercial projects. And then the generations of wealth, that, that whole movement for us this year is, is key. Um, the REI circle of trust, which is our mastermind that, you know, stems off of the generations of wealth, the generations of wealth voyage, which is our, our conference on a cruise ship. And uh, and we put out a, our negotiations training recently, which is uh, called No Means Not Yet. And mm. I, I did a, a two-day um, small interactive workshop with 20 people. We, re we recorded it. And the second day involves all live phone calls. And then we analyze the phone calls and talk about all the different things that we learned on day one, right? So, so that was really good. And yeah, I mean, I'm excited for this year, but just like most entrepreneurs, it doesn't happen fast enough. Um, there's always challenges with marketing and, and getting the word out there and keeping the wheels on the bus when it comes to everything going the right direction. So it's, it's going to be a good 2024, but a little different than the last 10 years. So you've had a certain level of success in your career already, and you've got a portfolio of properties. Like you probably don't need to put yourself through this. Like, why are you still pushing? Why are you still creating more problems for yourself? Because I'm an idiot, just like every other entrepreneur out there that, I mean, I don't, I'll never retire. I, I am too passionate about the deals and, and what's next, right? Like, like I get bored buying houses for cash because it's 
it's easy and it's boring. And so getting the, the creative juices flowing, whether it's houses or commercial or, um, you know, lending the, the masterminds I love because we're very, very tight knit and we're all helping each other. It's, it's, it's more of a board of advisors to each other. We, we rent a house, um, each group rents a house every six months. We all stay together and, you know, we're immersed in each other's lives for four to five days. So that gets the juices flowing. Uh, I, I would say I, could I back off on what I do? Sure. Um, but now I've got my kids that are coming up and, I don't really want to back off. I want to help them build what they want. So we'll see. Yeah. You used some, some words that I like in, in this talk and you said he gets the juices flowing. You're a deal junkie. I've heard that you're an adrenaline junkie as well. So like, is that just kind of like in your blood? Like you're just looking for the next, you know, kick, whether it's yeah. skydiving or doing the next deal or, or helping somebody. Yeah. And, and I, I think that's spot on. I do, I do it for the adrenaline, not for the money. And, and yes, my daughter turns 18 in September. So I'm taking her skydiving because I haven't jumped out of a plane in years and I want to get back into that. And, and it's all the same feeling, right? Like jumping out of a plane versus helping somebody out of a, a dire situation that honestly, very few other people were willing to or knew how to help them out of does come with very similar dopamine rushes, right? And, and, and the adrenaline and the dopamine, it makes you feel good. And why wouldn't I want to continue that, right? Yeah, it's a different world, right? Like we're a unique breed, us entrepreneurs. And, you know, some of us fail and have to go back to the nine to five and, you know, I've had times in my life where I've had to like really consider that because there was ups and downs and I just never wanted to do it. Like I, just, I think I would just, I don't, I don't know what would happen if I had to go to the job every day. Um, but you like, you've got outlets as well. Like, um, don't you have rodeo bulls? I, I do. And <laughs> in fact, that all started in a hot tub in Las Vegas uh, years ago, drinking beer. And I ended up talking with the right people or maybe the wrong people, depending on how you look at it. And yes, I, I bought in as a fractional owner into my first bucking bull. And that was a lot of animals ago. And, and actually literally as we're recording this, I should be in Fort Worth, Texas at, uh, the professional bull riders finals. However, this week it did not work. So it's the first time in 10 years, I think, that I missed the finals. But yeah, we ended up expanding and, and growing a, our own little herd of, of bucking bulls that live in Oklahoma. And, and uh, we get a, I mean, I don't ride the bulls because I'm old and stuff. But um, <laughs> I, I still would, but I think my wife would not appreciate pushing me around in a wheelchair. So but we, we kind of get the same rush, right? It, it's just a little, little adrenaline and, and, and we get to watch an animal that we have ownership in, um, on national television, on CBS sports every once in a while. And yeah, it's exciting. That's really cool. I don't know anybody who's doing anything like that, but I guess that's what you get from a guy who's born and raised in the middle of Wisconsin. <laughs> yeah. Well, I grew up racing stock cars and, and skydiving and bungee jumping and all that kind of stuff. And, and I still, I still love all the physical things. However, I'm middle-aged now, so my body may take a little bit longer to recover when I make some of those questionable decisions. So, but you have fun while you're doing it. Honestly, I live every day. Like it's my last because one day it will be. And, uh, one of the things I, I do talk about it publicly, just not as much. When the markets crashed in 07, we were going through that financial turmoil. We also discovered a couple of years prior to that my wife and I couldn't have kids naturally. So we were 
partially through an adoption of my son from China when I was no longer bankable. So I had to figure out how to pay for my son's adoption, which was the first time I ever raised private money. And, uh, and also my father had cancer and passed away at 64 years old. So that, that part of our life in the late 2007 to 10 range, it was, there was a lot of, of, of things coming at us all at once. And I, I feel like that's why I love giving back now, right? Like we've been through so much, but we came out of it on the other side and we can help others. Like that's our calling. And I feel like I'll get off my soapbox here in a second, Benson, but I feel like people give up way too damn easy nowadays. I feel like we're in a society of participation ribbons and, and everybody gets a trophy and that's, that's not life. It's just not life. I'd love to see everybody come out on top, but the reality is we're in a shifting market. There's going to be realtors that go down. There's going to be in, you know, real estate flippers and wholesalers and everybody across the gamut that's going to go down. It's a market cycle. And quite honestly, we need that. It's part of this business. It's part of every business. Oh, yeah. It's the natural order of things. Think about the environment and when when forests burn down through like lightning strikes and those fires come in and burn all the brush and you know, new, the soil is now renewed and flowers can grow again. And, you know, it's not, it's the same with, with, you know, the environment and the economy. Um, sometimes people, there's arsonists, they come in and burn the economy down intentionally. And I think there's some of that going on right now. Um, yeah, we better not talk about government. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a, a story for another day. Yeah. But there are certainly parallels there between what happens out there naturally and what we have to deal with in business. Um, and it's like you said, the perseverance, like that's, I, I want to let people know too, like how cool it is that you and your wife now are, are helping people through this process that you went through with your child and helping them through, you know, the conception and adoption process, because so many families struggle with that. Um, will you tell us a little bit about that? I mean, it is something that, if if you're a religious person, um, as, as I am, at the time when it was happening, you, you you start questioning, you know, why is this happening to me? Um, why why is it so easy for our tenants who have six kids with six different fathers to to you know have a family and and we can't? And it's not until years later when I started to openly admit and tell everybody it, it was the biggest blessing in the world um you know we have three children that because we adopted a, a, again um about six and a half years ago which was a questionable decision at age 42 to adopt a newborn mm -hmm. but um i wouldn't trade it for the world and and now yeah we get to help others and and it, it may not be financial help it might just be the emotional or you know, letting, letting them bend our ear when they need to. Um, we've been blessed to help a lot of families and hopefully we get to help a lot more over the years. Uh, but if we would have just felt sorry for ourselves and said, you know, God, why are you doing this to us? Uh, God didn't do anything to us. There was a reason. There was a path. We didn't know that path. I mean, that's our belief system, at least. And, and now, yeah, it's, it's very remarkable to watch, um, my oldest is 18 or I'm sorry, 17 going on 18. And my Chinese son is, is 13. And our, our youngest, um, uh, was born in, uh, Atlanta, Georgia or a suburb of Atlanta, Georgia. And she's six and to see that different dynamic, right? Like I have three kids, three different races. We live in the middle of a fairly redneck area of the country and you know people ask questions sometimes stupid questions but it 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 gets people talking and it gets people interacting and and it is actually very remarkable how many people go through uh miscarriages and and other fertility challenges and don't talk about it right so when they see you and, and they, they know it's a safe space, you can have a conversation about it. It's, it's a really cool thing. In fact, there's 
people I've met at real estate conferences that I probably would not have been approached by them or approached them at all. But somehow we hear about each other's family dynamic and it involved adoption. And it's it's an icebreaker. And uh, Joe McCall is one of them. Anybody that knows Joe McCall. Mm -hmm. Him and I had a fantastic conversation just about our adoption journeys and, you know, share a bond. So it's pretty cool. That's awesome. I mean, you're an inspiration. I got to say that. Like you've done so many cool things. And, you know, as I mentioned before, like you've had many opportunities to just kind of just bow out and nobody would have, you know, called you out for it, but you just keep pushing and pushing and, you know, you're helping so many people in real estate, but also, you know, with their family issues. And I just think it's awesome. All this, the cool things you got going on. Um, and I want to thank you for taking the time to to be here and share your story and, you know, that segment at the beginning when we were talking about negotiation, like that was just pure gold. So for anybody who's listening, uh, please reach out to Derek, um, you know, look into the REI circle of trust and look into the wealth building group and, and anything that Derek's working on. I, I promise you, this is somebody you want to, you know, hitch your, your, your carriage to, um, because he's just a wealth of knowledge. And I want to thank you for taking the time to uh to share all of that with us it, it's been a pleasure yeah i i appreciate it and and honestly I mean, anybody can find me at thegenerationsofwealth.com but don't take for granted what benson does for you guys you know your your faithful listeners of his listeners of his um you know share his message go out there we all rely on the on the the comments and and the ratings and reviews and everything else for all of our shows so we can help other people. So I appreciate Benson, you know, coming on my show and, and, you know, inviting me to be on yours. Uh, and, and I just hope I, I was able to help one or two people today that hear this message and, you know, if there's something I can do to help you, don't, I'm approachable. Don't hesitate to reach out. Yeah. And if you see Derek at a hotel bar, make sure you go up, and buy him a beer because you will hear some stories. I promise you some stuff that we couldn't talk about today, but um, Derek is a blast to hang out with. I didn't, I didn't think we were going to go there today, <laughs> <laughs> but not untrue. Awesome, man. Well, thank you so much again. And everybody, thank you so much for listening to this edition of the REI hacker podcast. Keep an eye out for future episodes where we're going to talk more about business and entrepreneurship and real estate investing and hearing inspiring stories so that we can keep pushing on and hopefully accomplish our goals to accumulate wealth and help others. So until next time, thank you so much for listening and we'll see you later. That's a wrap on today's real estate revelations. Thank you for tuning into the REI Hacker Podcast. Remember, every property has a story and every deal is a lesson. Until next time, Keep hacking the real estate world.